This is one of the uh, replacement boards you can get for the Breeze Audio Mini Power Amplifier. This kind of thing. And uh, this is a dual TPA3116 board. Uh, it's, and it's configured as a 2.1 uh, system. Uh, so you've got one TPA3116 uh, putting out a, a couple of stereo channels uh, and another one configured as parallel BTL uh, putting out one so-called base channel. And we've got a couple of op amps on the board and a lot of capacitors and resistors and stuff, so it's got some active filtering going on. Uh, and since it's labeled a 2.1 thing, it's obviously going to have some kind of high pass and low pass filtering in included on the board. So I figured we'd have a little play around and uh, just get a quick idea as to how this thing performs. Uh, general overview of the board, uh, you have a grossly undersized heatsink, it's going to have thermal issues, I guarantee it. Uh, you've got a power button which curiously doesn't turn off the power LED. Uh, the amplifier is actually turned off right now, uh, but the LED is lighting as soon as you've got power. Uh, you've got three potentiometers. Uh, this one is the volume for the left and right stereo channels. This one's the volume for the subwoofer channel. And this one is the main volume for everything. Uh, so that's a pretty weird arrangement. Uh, you know, since you uh, have the volume adjustment for everything and for the subwoofer, you really don't need to have a separate adjustment for the left and right channels since you can adjust the ratio of the subwoofer to the left and right channels anyway. So I'm not really sure why they've gone that way. It's probably just a, a general Chinese incompetence. I would much rather have seen that the third potentiometer was uh, something like a, a filter setting where you would adjust the uh, split frequency for the actual living high pass filters to allow you to uh, choose whatever character of a sound you want. And well, let's turn this thing on and just to see if we can get any output. So we're connected up to the subwoofer output right now and we're feeding an 8 ohm load, so let's go to the uh, distortion meter. Alright, so we're set up with the usual arrangement. We've got a vertical hood low pass filter. Uh, we're currently at the 10 volt range and we are putting in 60 hertz into the uh, amplifier and uh, we are getting uh, about 8 volts out of it. Uh, I've got the main volume maxed and I'm just adjusting on the uh, subwoofer volume, so we should be getting pretty neutral performance. Uh, right, so you, the, the first thing I want to know is what is the low pass filter set to? Uh, because that's going to be a question of taste and the various specifics about the uh, setup you're using it in. So let's just adjust this. Uh, let's go relative level and adjust to minus two decibels like so. And we'll just uh, change the frequency until it uh, changes. At 50 hertz, we're already down a bit. At 40 hertz, we're down a decibel. At 30 hertz, we're down 2.6 decibels. At 20 hertz, we are down 6 decibels. <laughs> Uh, right here, so this is not very good performance for a so-called subwoofer output. Uh, minus 3 decibel point at something like 30 hertz, and that, that's just not very usable at all. Uh, but I suppose for your generic cheap so-called subwoofer that uh, doesn't have a frequency response below 30 hertz, I suppose it doesn't matter, but yeah, for any kind of more real stereo or car stereo or something, this is not going to be very good. Not impossible to modify the board in order to make it better, but the yeah, output mocks that's pretty poor. So let's check the higher uh, range where it starts to roll off uh, in the high frequency. So 70 hertz, 80 hertz, 90 hertz, 100 hertz. Uh, down 0.2 decibels at 100 hertz. 110, 120, 130, 140. Down a decibel at 140 hertz. So we're really getting up into quite high frequencies for a so called subwoofer right now. Let's just go straight to 200. 
Yeah, we're down just about to 3 decibels at 200 hertz, 3 4 decibels, so. Yeah, that's not very good. This is more of a woofer frequency response than a subwoofer. I mean, at 200 hertz, you definitely wouldn't. That, that's not a very nice sounding subwoofer at all. You really want to cut it somewhere around 100 hertz. And you want to be down more than 3 decibels at that, and let's just see, 290, and we're starting to get down a bit 8 decibels. Yeah, so this isn't a very sharp, this isn't a very sharp filter, and it certainly isn't a very well configured filter at that. So, that's a bit of a letdown. But at least there is a filter, you don't have to add an external filter, and indeed that would be impossible since you just have the two stereo inputs, you don't have a separate input for the subwoofer. Uh, anyway, let's just see what kind of power output we can get, so 30 volt full scale, let's just turn it up, it's probably, well, where's the 24 volt supply, so it's probably going to do about 15 volts, same as we always do. 3% distortion full scale, so let's check at 1%, there will be a slight clipping. Uh, and we're actually over, we're at 16.5 volts uh, into 8 ohms, so that would be uh, just about 35 watts. So that, that's not too bad, we're getting a bit more power than out of a standard stereo configured TPA3116. Not too bad, uh, but uh, the big thing about these uh, parallel BTL configurations is that you, you, they should be great at driving low impedances since we essentially have two amplifiers in parallel. So let's uh, swap the load to 4 ohms and it probably won't be clipping too hard. Uh, 2% distortion, let's turn it down just a bit. There we go, 1%, so now we've got 15.5 volts into 4 ohms, and uh, that would be uh, 60 watts. So we're pushing 60 watts right now, that's not too bad. But I believe the TPA3116 is actually specified uh, to do uh, 2 ohms in parallel BTL mode. So let's just hook up a second 4 ohm load. And yeah, we're now drawing 5.5 amps out of a power supply, and are we clipping harder? Probably. There we go, 1%, and now we've got about 13.7 uh, volts into 2 ohms. And that would be 93.8 watts, so we are pushing almost 100 watts into this thing. And that's not too bad, not too bad at all. But uh, I can feel on the heatsink with my fingers that if we keep this up, it's gonna overheat like, like all of these do. I mean, if, if we go into harder clipping, like uh, uh, ten percent, like so, we can probably get over a hundred watts into two ohms, and that's exactly fifteen volts. And that's a hundred and twelve watts into two ohms uh, at very hard clipping. So it wouldn't sound too good, but. If you've got just some cheap subwoofer which you just want to go loud, uh, that's an acceptable performance figure. And that's not too bad. But yeah, it is overheating right now. Well, not exactly yet, but if I point the heat gun at it, the, yeah, we're at about 100, 100 degrees Celsius out of a heat sink with just the one subwoofer channel driven, so that's not too impressive performance. But still, I can do it at peak peak power. Not too bad. So let's check uh, out the uh, other two channels uh, to see if they have a high pass filter on them instead. Uh, I'm kind of torn whether or not I want them to have a high pass filter. Uh, it would be nice to have uh, two full range channels uh, and plus one extra subwoofer channels and channel and just let uh, the natural roll off of the speakers uh, do the high passing for you. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, that uh, would possibly give you some issues with overdriving your uh, stereo speakers, since you might be giving them just as much bass as you're giving the subwoofer. Uh, we'll find out. So we're connected up to the one of the front channels now. We're gonna remove the extra load. Get eight ohms. 
So let's just turn it up and see what happens. There we go, we're on the 10 volt full scale range, we're at 200 hertz, let's go to uh, 1 kilohertz and let's just uh, adjust it for minus 2 decibels, like so. And so let's see if it's going to roll off when we lower the frequency. So 100 hertz, still flat. 90 hertz, 80, 70, 60, 50. And we, now we're actually up 0.2 decibel. Uh, 40, now we're up 0.4 decibels. Uh, 30 hertz, uh, now we're up 0.6 decibels. 20 hertz, now we're just up 0.4 and 10 hertz. Ah, uh, we're down 0.6. So, that's weird. So we've actually got a uh, better low frequency response out of the front channels than we do the so-called subwoofer channel. Um, <laughs> that's an oddity. So the front channels certainly are full range on this thing. Uh, let's check uh, the high end response on them. Let's just uh, start at 10 kilohertz. And we're down 0.8 decibels. Uh, 20 kilohertz, we're down just about 3 decibels. And uh, let's just change to a better low pass filter. Yeah, that's more fair. We're actually up 0.2 decibels at 20 kilohertz, so that's not too bad. Flat at 10. That's actually really nice and flat in the higher range. So let's see if, what kind of distortion we're getting. We're not putting out a huge amount of power. Yeah, 20 kilohertz. Uh, we are at over 1% distortion. Even, even though we are not pushing anywhere near the rated power if we turn it up. It actually goes down slightly. That's a bit weird. But yeah, as, as is seems to be the trend with these Chinese TPA3116 amplifiers. They, they don't perform very well at high frequencies. Let's check 10 kilohertz. Yeah, still over 1% distortion. And it also goes down when I turn up the volume. And that's a bit of an oddity. Still over 1 kilohertz. It's probably going to be performing okay. No, that's actually looking pretty terrible. So we're putting out uh, just about 10 volts, which isn't too much, it's just over 10 watts. And uh, we're getting over a percent of distortion. That's not very good. That's not very good at all. It goes down when I turn it down, so that's not too impressive. That's certainly not too impressive. That's even worse than the uh, or stock board in the uh, Breeze Audio Amplifier. That's, oh, oh no, hang on, we've got the... You uh, know, one day I've got the... Uh, had the 80 kilohertz high pass instead of the 30... Uh, the low pass instead of the 30 kilohertz, so... That's going to upset stuff, and now it's looking a bit better, but we still have almost 1% of distortion. Like 0.65 there at... Uh, 5 volts of output, so that's not very good, no, that's not very good at all. Let's turn it up a bit and see. You know, we're over 1% again. So this really isn't performing very well, it's actually performing very poorly. I'm going to have to elaborate a bit more, figure out what's causing this, because this is absolutely horrible performance. Really horrible performance. Alright, so let's just have a look at what the distortion actually looks like. So we're now looking at the output of the amplifier in on one channel of the analog scope, and we've got the distortion waveform in this uh, jiggity wiggly wave there. And uh, this just looks like a normal third order harmonic distortion to me. So it's just. Uh, that, there's no magic in this, it's just distorting like uh, a normal amplifier would, like. Like a class AB amplifier, really. Yeah, so it seems we've just got a very high distortion of its output. I don't know what else to say. It's not any speaker wrecking class D oscillator rubbish, anyway. So, yeah. It will really assume we can see some traces of the high frequency switching noise there, but that's not a lot. 
High distortion is just a normal amplifier distortion, nothing more to it. Oh well. And while we're at it, let's just uh, turn it up really high to see what the clipping waveform is like, because these Class D amplifiers tend to be a bit ugly when they just start to clip. And yeah, we are getting a bit of odd high frequency stuff there. Let's just disable the low pass filter, but that's actually looking that's actually a very clean uh, clipping waveform for one of these. Uh, just a bit of crap. But that's yeah, but I don't mind that. That's perfectly acceptable. Perfectly acceptable clipping waveform. I, I I'd almost call that an excellent clipping waveform compared to some of the worst ones I've seen. Uh, I remember the Pi in particular was absolutely horrid when it came to the clipping waveform. It would just oscillate extremely crudely uh, just as it was starting to clip. And that could actually damage your speakers if you're unlucky. But this one's behaving a lot nicer. So at least it's got something right. But you know, turn it back down and we've just got a lot of distortion. Just across the board, a lot of distortion. So here before we wrap this up, here's just a quick look at the actual board. Uh, Notable features, we've got uh, two NE5532s, uh, they're obvious Chinese copies of some brand name. Uh, the board was originally delivered with just the uh, holes there, I soldered some pieces of copper wire in there to probe around. Mm, we've got a lot, most of the filtering components seem to be centered around the op amps there. So if you wanted to, you could probably just reverse engineer this and change the filter around quite easily. It's not going to be anything you know, super fancy. I am a bit uh, curious as to why they've actually got uh, two op amps. Probably one of them is acting as an input buffer for everything, and uh, the other one is just acting as uh, a two-stage uh, low-pass filter for the... Uh, subwoofer output, so uh, can we have a quick look at that? Yeah, it's not entirely obvious how everything's connected up, but the input does seem to run straight into this potentiometer, so that's a bit weird. The main volume is just uh, connected straight as a divider on the input. <sighs> Alright, so hours later uh, I started mucking around with this thing, trying to figure out kind of how the filters are designed in it, because all the frequency response measurements were got from the base part, they just kind of didn't make much sense. Uh, tracing everything out on this board is a major pain since it's a black board dual layer, so you basically need to beep your way through it. But uh, it seems that uh, these two op amps, they only handle the uh, base speaker. Uh, this one seems to be a relatively high gain buffer uh, just on the input and uh, this one seems to handle most of the uh, low-pass filtering. Uh, but uh, the real, uh, the weird low-frequency issue we're seeing was due to these two capacitors. They were originally one microfarad and that was just uh, not high enough for them to pass uh, low-frequency signals very well, so I upgraded them to 2.2 microfarad and that gives it a, a reasonable frequency response. It, uh, it uh, just starts dropping off at 20 hertz instead of the like 40 hertz we saw in the original uh, design. Uh, I also replaced these two caps with 2.2 uh, microfarad caps from the original 1 microfarad caps at some stage. I didn't remember what happened, but uh, I haven't removed them, so clearly it must have been an improvement. Uh, but uh, the real big issue seems to be in this op amp circuit here uh, with regards to the low pass filter because uh, I don't, I'm not really certain how they've done it but they obviously implemented an extremely unsharp filter. I removed these two capacitors and underneath them are actual la labels uh, for what the <laughs> designer intended the values to be and uh, that would be uh, 0.22 microfarad var and uh, 0.1 microfarad var uh, the board had 0.22 microfarad installed on both positions originally and that gave a stupid high uh, cutoff frequency and uh, replacing them with the labeled values just gave an even higher uh, frequency cutoff. Uh, 
but the most uh, sensible combination I've been able to figure out is to have a 1 microfarad capacitor on this one and a 0.7 microfarad capacitor on this one. Uh, and that gives us a response, uh, let's see, on the meter. Right, we're at 80 Hz right now, we are rolled off quite steeply. Uh, so this will give us a response if we meet to 70 Hz, 60, 50, 40, 30. So we've got a reference level about at 30 Hz at minus 2. Uh, start rolls off a beta decibel at 20 Hz and at 10 Hz we're just gone again. But really we've got it. Uh, 30 Hz 0 dB, 40 Hz minus 1, 50 Hz minus 2 ish. 60 Hz minus 4, 70 Hz uh, minus uh, 5, 80 Hz minus 6, 7, and 90 Hz were approaching minus 10 or something. So th this just gives the amplifier a pretty. well, it gives it a subwoofer response essentially, uh, where it just uh, gives you more amplitude the lower in frequency you go. Uh, it seems I can't really get this filter to behave very nicely since it just seems to be incredibly unsharp. I'm not really sure how they've managed to do that given that they have four op amps here. Well actually it's pretty obvious because they are running a stereo signal through all of the filtering and they just mono mix it in the end which is just stupid. If They should actually be mono mixing it right off the get go and, uh, and just applying more stages of filtering. Or they might be mono mixing it somewhere along the path. I'm pretty sure this op amp at least it has a stereo signal going into it and a stereo signal going out of it. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's I haven't bothered reverse reverse engineering this very uh, properly. I must admit I've mostly just been swapping components randomly to see what happens. Uh, but anyway, that at least gives this particular board a reasonable response. So. I did remove the heatsink in order to see if there's any particular stuff under there and uh, there doesn't seem to be anything uh, regarding the op amps. These caps seem to be just general support stuff for the uh, base TPA3116 and uh, obviously this is the base amplifier, this is the uh, full range amplifier and just uh, the general support stuff. Uh, the chips themselves these actually look relatively genuine. Uh, they look better than the ones in the original Breeze Audio Amplifier. They have clearer writing on them, but they probably are rejected or fake given the price point of these boards. The heatsink mounting on this board is also pretty good. Well, I've just used one screw in the middle with a spacer is to press down on the board and plenty of thermal paste to go around, so I actually like that quite a lot. Better than the original board as well. Uh, oh well, I'm basically out of stuff to say about this board at this point. I'm happy to use this one in this configuration once the subwoofer section has been fixed and the performance on the front channels was actually pretty good. Uh, save for the high distortion, it, it, it's got a good frequency response and it'll probably sound good enough. I should also point out that the uh, output filter seems to be pretty good on this one. We've got plenty of caps and all of these caps are also in the output filter. Uh, that's a lot of components and it's a lot better than on the other 2.1 board I have where we just basically have one coil and uh, one cap and that's basically it for the output filter so this one's probably going to be uh, quite a bit noisier in the out of band range. Well, let's just do a quick uh, out of band noise check on this thing before we end the video. And as expected the out of band noise seems to be pretty good. We're using the uh, soft f software filtering functionality of Rigel Scope here to view everything between 25 kilohertz and 1 megahertz and we're sitting at about 20 to 40 millivolts peak to peak and that's just fine. Excellent performance really. So I'll let that round off this little quick look at this uh, replacement amplifier board for the Breeze Audio Amplifier. I hope you found it a bit interesting. Cheerio!